went down. Many thanks for staying with us. And here with me is the first Attorney General under the new constitution, uh, Professor Gidu Mugai. Thank you so much for making time for us. Prof, a lot of people are wondering, what have you been up to, up to since you left office in 2018? Oh, many things, but uh, principally uh, regaining my life. Uh, when you're away from your life for seven years, uh, you need uh, to catch your breath. Uh, so I'm back teaching uh, the great love of my life, which is teaching. Um, I'm teaching back at my old law school. Uh, I'm doing arbitrations, local, international. Uh, I'm practicing uh, law at my old farm. Obviously not eight to five anymore because I've run out of that sort of energy. And I'm writing my memoirs in two, in two, in two volumes. I'm writing my academic book, so it's a full life. Prof, it's been two years since you left your office as Attorney General, and uh, a lot of people would like to know what's life been like, being on the other side or the outside, and also what's your perspective on the way the government is being run currently? Well, first I like, uh, I like being a civilian. <laughs> I like not being blamed for everything that has gone wrong uh, when you are the Attorney General. Everybody who is unhappy with anything going wrong within the entire legal sector blames it on you uh, and blames uh, every advice on you. So it's good to be a civilian and, and to rest. Uh, I, I think that uh, we, uh, our constitutional democracy is strong. Uh, I think uh, it is functioning well. I think it has uh, wear and tear problems like uh, democracies all over the world. But I think that this constitution gave us a better government, uh, gave us more vibrant institutions. I think devolution was a great idea. Uh, I, we probably ought never to have devolved to, to so many units, but it is definitely the right thing to do to take power and money back to the people and away from the bureaucrats in Nairobi. Uh, so I, I, I have great confidence in the future of our country. What is the one thing you miss about being a public servant, being in the limelight, being in the limelight, being in public, if you miss that life at all? I don't miss the limelight. Uh, I think the limelight is an illusion. But I miss, I miss, uh, I miss the, the, the authority to do the right thing. Yeah, you know, I would, when I was in government, I would see things that were not functioning and I would proactively get in there and fix them. Uh, now I can't do that anymore. Are people in government doing the right thing? Oh, I'm sure they are. They, I'm sure they are. It's a difficult job. It's a very, very difficult job. I can tell you that for free. Uh, I, uh, you know, you can imagine being a CS Treasury and everybody is asking for money <laughs> and the collecting uh, agencies are hampered by covid by all manner of things it's a very difficult job and i think we as citizens don't give the public servants the the encouragement that they need let's talk matters constitution you had mentioned earlier about the constitution it's 10 years on where are we as a country, Prof? Uh, I think we have achieved much, but much remains to be done. We definitely have achieved much, uh, much remains to be done. Uh, I think we have stabilized the constitutional order, in my opinion. Uh, it, uh, in the areas of personal uh, freedoms, uh, I think that uh, our civil liberties regime is much better than it's ever been before. Am I then not, am I then not uh, concerned about, say, police, police, uh, police misconduct? I am. Uh, I, I think we need to get the, the culture of the Constitution inculcated in the, in, in the bureaucracy of government. Uh, I, I'd like to see... Uh, you know, better handling of civilians, say, by, by police, 
so that's some area we need to work on uh, uh, and but on the whole I see a civic culture that is stronger I like to read my newspapers and they are they are robust they are critical I listen to the radio and TV and people are not intimidated they speak their minds whether in vernacular or in, in Swahili or in, and I think that's a good space. So according to you, people have a voice? I think people have a voice. And uh, can that voice be stronger? Yes. Should it be made stronger? Yes. But uh, is it strong already? Uh, it's a f we are moving in the right direction. When I listen to my students and uh, young people in general, I, I am quite inspired. Uh, the the sort of intellectual uh, debates going on about what is the direction of our nation, what is the destiny of our people, what does it mean to be a Kenyan, uh, they, they give me great confidence that the future will be better than the past. You are very much involved in the drafting and formation of the Constitution. Is this the Kenya you envisioned, thought it would be, 10 years down the line? One of the things that I dreamt about, and I'm sure everybody involved in the process dreamt about, is that we would create, by the Constitution 2010, greater national unity, greater integration of our people, as you know, we come from a multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural, multireligious uh, society. And uh, blending that is not something you do in one decade or in two decades or indeed three. I think it's a work in progress. The Kenya we dream about uh, is a work in progress. Am I happy with the progress? Yes, I am. Am I, am I, am I saying I'm, ha I'm so happy that there is nothing left to be done? No, 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 no. I'm saying I am happy with the progress. We are moving in the right direction. Citizens are asking the right questions. Politicians are, are debating the right issues, even amongst themselves. So I see a future in which I have confidence. You, what are some of the hindrances? Uh, you know, or some of the things hindering the implementation of the 2010 document? Well, first, it's its its, its own its its own architecture. You see, this when you when you when you write a constitution, when you draw a constitution, you are like an architect who who designs a building. You imagine it in your mind, and you imagine it how it will be built, and you imagine how it will be lived in. But after all that is done, you stand away from the building and you see the, the door shouldn't have been there, the windows shouldn't have been there. And, and that's what is happening now. When I stand outside the Constitution 2010, I see things we put that we shouldn't have put. I see things we didn't put that we should have put. So it isn't so much a problem of implementing it's a problem of uh, of imag imagining a redesign a redesign of of the same uh, or constitution time to amend the documents going by the calls in the bbi report if you ask me personally are there things there that i would like to change my answer would be yes, yes. i speak i speak for myself uh, for example, the design of the legislature that made the Senate, the lower house, and, and the National Assembly, as it were, the upper house, was totally wrong. Granted that that is not what we had planned in Bombers, I would revise that I would revise that and I would reverse that. Senate should be an upper chamber filtering legislation emanating from the lower chamber. That's one thing I would do. Constitutional commissions. Too many 
too ineffectual, too uh, too unfocused. I probably would have the Public Service Commission and the Judicial Service Commission, I would get all the other commissions to get back into the ministries they come from and we should strengthen the ministerial system, strengthen cabinet and, 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 and we will get a better result in my opinion. In a moment, is the Senate playing its role, doing its job as per the constitution? It is, in the very limited role that was left to it by, 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 by the constitution as finally enacted. I think it would be a much more effective body if it, had, if it was allowed to do what the upper chamber does in most constitutional democracies. From the experience we now have is more than 20%. I think 20% was a figure of speech. If we were to revisit uh, 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 the constitution, ask ourselves a simple question. What worked? What didn't? And what can we do about it? We may find that there are several things we need to, to examine. I, I like devolution myself. I think it's very important. The way we finally enacted it is wrong in my opinion. We have too many counties, some of them not viable. Number two, the, the, I, the, the, the attempt to reproduce the national structure at the county level. You have a legislature that has a speaker, that has a leader of the opposition, that has uh, nominated members and so on and so forth. And uh, it was totally wrong. We needed a small, effective bureaucracy managing the county and a proper county with the economic muscle for self-sufficiency. If you listen to the debate around the devolution today, it is a debate that says, send us more money, send us more money from the center. I'm sure you've never heard any debate saying, we are making enough money, yeah? We are making enough money here. Can we send you something in Nairobi? And that is what devolution should be at some point. Okay? The county should be self-sustaining at its best. And, and, and right now we are not seeing much of that. So it's not a success so far, that aspect of it is not a success. What I think is a success, and much I'm proud of that, is that the people are saying what they want to see done within their own local community. So we have a direct participation by the people. They are saying, we, this is our priority here. I don't know what the priority in Nairobi is, but here in Isiolo, here in Garissa, here in Meru, here in Embu, these are our priorities. Are really, people are really feeling the services being brought down, you know, like you're saying, in, in the counties, are the services really reaching the Monanchi? I, 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 would, I would like to hope that uh, this is part of what local democracy should be about. People holding the governor to account, people co holding their MCAs to account. And these are people who live next to you. They are not far away people in Nairobi, they are people who live in, in, in your county. You should be asking them, okay, why don't we have a bridge over this particular river so that our children can go to school when a bridge costs less than 10 million shillings? It's a foot bridge. Those are the questions that should be asked at the local level. Uh, and that's where we shall strengthen uh, our democracy. I think parliament is too large myself, if you ask me. I think we should reduce the number of seats. Uh, it's... Uh, and. Uh, I think that uh, the quality of democracy has not improved by us increasing the number of MPs. <laughs> so that's another thing I would like us to rethink. Uh, we, uh, you know, and, and there are so many other things. Gender. What do we want to do about gender? All right. That debate has been on and off since we started, 2010. 
uh, 10 years later, it's unresolved. Uh, when I was in government, I, I, I drafted three different bills. We were unsuccessful. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a question we need to put to bed sooner than later. The BBI reports, is it a good report? Is it a good document in your own view? I haven't gone through it with a toothbrush because I understood it to be an interim document. So I'm reserving my energies to, for, the final. for the final document. But uh, the broad themes that I saw are, are, are the same themes that uh, I am concerned about and most of the people I have talked to are concerned about. What is the biggest success under the 2010 Constitution, according to you? I think the Constitution 2010 achieved a number of things. The process of producing it created such an elevated uh, uh, civic uh, responsibility among Kenyans that there isn't a part of Kenya today where people don't feel I have a right to contribute to the debate about the future of my country. You would be shocked at how many countries that is not the case. So here the political consciousness in the consciousness about freedom and rights and participation in, 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 in governance is very, very high. And I attribute it to the process that generated the Constitution 2010. The Constitution itself achieved a number of things, I thought. In many countries, there are issues that are off the table and they continue to destabilize politics from off the table. What I think this constitution did was to go into our history and look at all our problems and put them on the table. The problem of ethnicity. We have several ethnic communities in Kenya. It was not hidden. It was placed on the table. The question of religion. The question of our diversities, the question of uh, an equal development, a poor north versus a poor, uh, uh, a richer, not very richer, but a richer south. They were all put on the table. I think that that is a great achievement because it, into the future, our children and their children will never now remove these things from the future and pretend, uh, let us... Let us pretend that these problems don't exist. Speaking of sharing, uh, Prof, before you go on, what's your view on the uh, CRA proposed uh, third generation revenue formula? Quite frankly, I have tried to understand where the logjam is, and uh, I've had, had some difficulties. Um, because the truth is that uh, you want, you want resources to go to better the lives of people not the lives not not anything else the lives of people so numbers matter you cannot you cannot send money where money is not required because there are no people to call number two we have a mechanism in this constitution, a very special mechanism for topping up an equalization fund. So I have never, if I have never understood why uh, we cannot follow the proposal given by the commission and then put our eyes on the problem of equalization where necessary that's my that's my view let's talk a bit about the relationship between the executive and the judiciary has not been so rosy keeping in mind that uh chief justice david moraga's term is expected to end on january 2021 next year do you see the relationship between the two houses uh, between the two uh, branches changing anytime soon? Oh, I think uh, I wouldn't call it. Uh, you see, the judiciary is functioning. As, as I've told you, I spend uh, quite a bit of my time there. 
I've, uh, before I came to this interview, I've just conducted uh, a Zoom court proceeding that went very, very well. <laughs> Uh, the you know, in that court there were more than 30 lawyers. Uh, I think there were more than 40 cases, and the speed at which matters were being resolved was very good. That the, the the so the truth is that the the, the judiciary is functional. Uh, I think we have very we have a very good crop of judges. I think the succession uh, in the judiciary will be very smooth. Uh, I I don't worry so much that every so often there are territorial issues between the judiciary, the executive, the legislature. That, that is that's a given. It is a given. It is a, in all democracies. You will find that uh, the executive says the judiciary is overreaching. The judiciary says the executive does is not respecting the rule of law. Parliamentarians say, you know, uh, 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 we we uh, we are not voting enough money to the judiciary because the judiciary is only one of several institutions to which we should vote money, and it should not expect special privilege. These are normal wear and tear issues in a constitutional democracy. All right, Professor Githumwege, thank you so much for making time for us. But we would like to know, any hints on your next big assignment, maybe in public office? Do you see yourself going back anytime soon? <laughs> no, no, I, you know, I was, um, um, in my generation, most of us were educated on public money. So I, uh, I have been a public servant. I feel I have paid my debt to society. And a new generation will, will take the struggle to build our democracy to the next level. Thank you so much, Prof. But you just never know. Thank you so much for making time for us. That is the first Attorney General under the new constitution, Professor Gidu Mwigai. Once again, thank you for making time for us here on TV 47. Welcome back. Let's get into the world of sports. Now retired.